Okay, a federal judge today has struck down the CDC's uh, eviction moratorium, uh, ban on evictions today. And uh, is it too little, too late? Is this enough that we can save some of these properties from the mod pod landlords that are out there? I don't know. Again, too little, too late. You're going to have both sides of the story, uh, you know, either pro or cons on this in the next little while. We're going to hear a lot of the rhetoric for sure. So welcome to Housing Bubble 2.0 News of the Week, or as I like to call it, another episode of As the Housing Market Turns. Today is the 5th of May. What does that mean? It's Cinco de Mayo. So everyone please celebrate and enjoy the day, the day as best as possible. Randy Patrick here putting the realism in real estate because we need that. It's really about who do I believe, who do I trust, where's my information coming from these days, um, how's it being spun, what's being hidden from us, blah, blah, blah. You know, the routine here, right? A lot going on. But first of all, next week I'm going to do another State of the Nation, uh, we'll call it sort of, well, not really a webinar, but just presentation. It's going to be on my Facebook Live page. Uh, these are not normally 20, 30 minute videos, they're usually 90 minutes to 120 minutes, two hours, uh, interactive because people are asking questions and commenting all the time. So it's actually a great presentation. Uh, please try to uh, join this if you can. I'm going to talk about what's happening right now behind the scenes and reasons and information you're going to need to know for the very near future. So because things are changing, people, it's time. All, right? all I'm going to say is it's time. All right. Uh, for those of you who are going to say, I don't do Facebook, listen, I appreciate that. But here's the deal. I can't really do this on YouTube anymore. Well, I haven't done this on YouTube. I don't want to because of things I've spoken about in the past. So I'd like to keep this sort of offline. I'm looking at additional ways to get information to people as we speak right now anyway. All right. So please attend this. I'll have more notifications coming up the next little while about this. All right, guys. So the information today, the big news is federal judge overturns national eviction ban. So what do we see is the fact that you're going to have complaints. You're going to have, um, you know, one in five people across the U.S. are behind their, on their payments amid the pandemic. And states are scrambling to disperse more than $45 billion in rent assistance well they're not scramming it too quick as far as uh, the mon pod landlords are concerned and um, you know that's what's causing these problems here so housing advocates are I've said the national ban is necessary to stave off an unprecedented displacement of Americans which could worsen the pandemic just as the country is turning a corner um, so that's what we're gonna see so we're gonna see people saying you can't do this you know it's gonna hurt the country others saying it's gonna save the housing industry and save the economy so who knows but you know really it's it's going to be a, a heavily contested and scrutinized decision. So here we got the lady from the president and CEO of the National Low Income Housing Co um, Coalition saying she was hopeful um, that that you know the impact wouldn't be as huge. But several court rulings have attempted to strike down the moratorium, but all had limited application. While this ruling is written more starkly than previous ones, it likely has equally limited application, impacting only the plaintiffs who brought the case. Okay, whatever that means. The, the point, though, is that if you need to, you know, start, if you're a landlord, start to file, guys. I mean, that I think is is what this is really saying to us here. Um, obviously, this is out saying, you know, a month ago, the Wall Street Journal you know, talked about, you know, continuing government bans on eviction and foreclosure are doing more harm than good for the housing industry. In short, the government is, is bludgeoning private businesses to fix a problem that it created. Landlords say they increasingly can't afford their mortgage payments, utilities, and maintenance costs because they can't remove non-paying renters. So here's the deal, okay? And then this crisis, well, these crisis programs are distorting the housing market which we know. So we're seeing it right now. So you can look at mainstream media and you can see that everything is great and housing, low interest rates, you know, low inventory, prices are going up, you know, get a house now. It's going to go up in the future. But in the end, this is all causing us a lot of stress, a lot of grief, and it's having people pay more for properties and, and having more problems down the road. So the, the whole point, though, is that um, when you say, uh, well, why should this happen now? Well, you know, if you're believing the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, the jobless rate has dropped to 6% from 14.8%, and employers are desperate to hire. So I mean, I don't know how many times I'm driving around town, because I you know, do that virtually every day, go out, look for properties, look at deals and stuff like that, and I'm seeing, you know, now hiring. We're hiring, we're hiring. I'm seeing, you know, bonuses, 50 bucks just to, you know, put an application. So businesses are desperate to hire people, all right, uh, to work. And, and a lot of people just, I think there's a segment of the population who's been getting stimulus checks and UI and said, I don't want to work. Well, you know what? Uh, the protection is off now. You, you know, money has to flow. Uh, and if you're a landlord, you know what? Sometimes landlords, you know, have the way houses or, or multifamily complexes are constructed uh, and set up, etc. physically that 
they're paying utilities um, and that's built into the rent, right? So if you're not paying the rent, uh, your landlord's paying utilities, they're paying property tax, they're paying maintenance fees, um, they're paying insurance fees, they're still paying all this to allow someone to live even though they're not paying. And and if you take if you think about this, right, you know, there's a potential that someone could have been in their their property since when? Since April uh, of 2020 and are still in it right now not paying their rent. So I mean that's a lot to ask people to dip into their savings for and, and kind of cover on their own. So I, I do think that this, you know, this was long, you know, people have been fighting this from, from day one here, and this is the result of all that, I do believe. So, you know, if we move forward here, we can take a look at, you know, um, you know the billion, the issue is that the billions of dollars that Congress allocated for the relief starting December, and then at the second allocation in March, really um, hasn't um, helped any of the landlords. Why? Because the rollout has been moving at the speed of bureaucracy, which is really, really low. And I, I guess that's the big thing. So if I'm a landlord, how do I get relief? Okay, first of all, are the tenants getting relief, number one? And, and two, are, is that relief being passed on to the landlords? I don't personally know. Second, if I'm a landlord, where do I get my relief? And that's another issue here. So basically, um, you know, the, the current administration, you know, has sought to extend the eviction moratorium to June 30th, which further, you know, complicates life for landlords, whatever, even though some states and some locations are kind of open up a little bit right now and sort of viewing the law differently. Um, this, I think, is, is a landmark situation right now for, for the industry to move forward and sort of try to get back on its feet. Um, I'll put a link into the article, but you can actually take a look at this is called a, um, a memorandum of opinion, uh, which basically is the, the, the federal court judge basically going through the CDC, the scope of the CDC, why the CDC is in play. And the fact that when you go through and read this, I did take a read, that they really kind of are overstepping their bounds because the way the CDC's mandates are created, this, it doesn't, this does not fall under them to do that. So I believe that they felt, hey, let's jump on this to do great for society and the country. But this really, you know, hasn't helped people. I'm sure it has. Hasn't hurt people. It has as well, too. So it just depends on which side of the fence you sit on. Are you a landlord? Are you a renter? You know, what's your situation here? I mean, are you employed? Are you getting UI and stimulus checks? I mean, there, there's a lot of, I guess, criteria that goes involved here. But the, the issue ultimately boils down to that, you know, who is paying for this? And, you know, the, the unfortunate part is you have protection or, or protection is given for, um, you know, tenants, but the same protection was is not necessarily given given to landlords, especially if they have, you know, mortgages that aren't covered by forbearance and things like that. So, you know, utility companies, insurance companies, federal tax, like, you know, sorry, a property tax, whatever, there's no moratorium for landlords that they can actually let this ride. All right. And here's the deal. If you're a landlord, you know, the money is lost, right? It's not like you're going to recoup 12 months worth of, um, worth of, I guess you could say, uh, income from, from anybody. It's just basically, you know, cutting the losses moving forward and getting a different tenant in. That's how it boils down. So, oh, by the way, if you're not already a subscriber, if you could do me a great favor, help my channel grow, smash that subscribe button. I really appreciate that. Secondly, if you think you're a subscriber, could you please check because I'm having a lot of issues with losing subscribers and people not getting notifications. So please uh, do me a favor and smash that button. I'd really appreciate that. So um, sort of furthering the, the landlord issue here uh, and then the eviction stuff, the mom and pa landlords dine on the vine as unevictable tenants enjoy you know, pandemic protections. This came out, you know, about a week ago. And really what it boils down to is the same thing as the fact that, you know, um, they're pushing mom, pa investors uh, into a financial hardship uh, forced to, and what's going to happen is they're going to force to sell to wealthy investors. You see, so it's like I look at it's wealth transfer. So typically, what happens in housing crisis and crash is you do have something called wealth transfer. So you know people lose their home for foreclosures, people you know lose their equity, and then it's usually either fire sales, discount sales, or distress sales where there's no equity, but you know other people are picking up properties like hedge funds, like you know the big investors for for you know a much more reduced price, and someone who has spent time effort money, their savings, their livelihood, um, you know, t you know, again, trying to manage and, and, and run their small rental business is left with nothing, which is a very unfortunate. So really, um, again, it's, it, it, it's important that, you know, this, you know, when you take a look at the number of homes that smaller landlord groups, the mom pa segment actually provide to the rental population, it's in that neighborhood of you know eighteen to twenty million rental properties, rental units, right? These aren't necessarily multifamily complexes; they're duplexes, triplexes, quads, single-family homes, whatever. So there's a lot of people that rely upon this segment of the population for housing, 
and they seem to have been forgotten in the shuffle and not protected. So you knew at some point in time it was going to happen. So really, um, it boils down to if you take a look at you know the, the government situation is a quagmire. Uh, really, you know, it says so what now? Um, um, that said, it's not. See, the problem is it's not known how many landlords themselves are in desperate situations because you know all the information we see we talk about the forbearance numbers and delinquency numbers and stuff like that so a lot of us just is just based on retail stuff like forbearance is I look as forbearance is retail all right and it's extrapolation and sampling it's not really true numbers that we see so there's always this euphoria of oh great we see forbearance numbers dropping now well that's because of what you know, maybe end of the quarter, end of the forbearance cycle, what's going to happen. So, uh, you know, the long-term concern here is over the course of a few years, this growing share of mom pod landlords will be forced to sell and rents will go up. So in the end, you're right, it doesn't help the marketplace. Uh, landlords either sell or if they get back on their feet, then they're going to raise rent to essentially go back and try to recoup and cover the losses. And what's going to happen is if rents go up, that's going to make it unaffordable for a lot of people who do need places to live and probably, you know, maybe haven't gone down the path of not paying their rent. So in the end, it just hurts this community, uh, you know, a number of communities, the rental community, the landlord community, you know, more than anticipated for sure. They say the situation's a quagmire, other challenges are looming. For example, um, New York's $2.4 billion portion of the funds that were allocated by Congress is expected to cover less than 80% of the back rent. Utilities and late fees owed in the state of uh, in the state as of March. Um, in Illinois, it's just 45%. It's going to cover. Vermont gets roughly um, 350 million allocation. Have to pay for the states need more than nine times over. So figure that out. So really, there seems to be a disparity and as to what states are getting what allocation of funds. And that's the, this, this is the first part, okay? So um, the reallocation can't happen for several more months. And then guess what? Um, you gotta get the money. So how does a landlord get the money? How does a landlord get relief? I have no idea. And you know, that's the thing. That, so the bureaucracy is not helping the situation. And that's where, so even though, even though there could be relief on the way, yeah, let's at least you know, pat ourselves on the back, it's not there, and we're still going to have the carnage uh, for the people who are involved. So that's the unfortunate part. So that's what goes on in today. So I believe I do think that today is, is kind of a, I, I don't know if you call it a landmark decision, but it's something that's been brewing for a long time. It's happened. Now, I, I talked about this actual article a few weeks ago. This came out in early April. And what it boiled down to was the Florida Circuit Court's ordered to move pending foreclosure cases. And um, it's also going to look at eviction cases the same way, too. So basically, the court systems are saying, enough. We've got all this backlog here. We don't care about moratoriums anymore. We're just going to start, you know, start processing our cases because, you know, the expectation is, uh, you know, one, you know, lots of evictions are, are, are on the dockets, uh, foreclosures are backlogged, and more will be coming. So this kind of goes to show that, you know, some of the states that are opening up were already doing their own thing, regardless of whether the CDC, um, CDC's position was overturned. But now I, I guess you could say it's more official that the you know, federal judge has ruled it to be, you know, it's overturned, unconstitutional, whatever it is. Um, to, just to keep everybody informed, um, this came out the other day here, end of the month of April, Dallas Fed president spook stocks. Why? Because we've got real excesses in the housing market rate hike needed in 2022. Uh, basically that, you know, this guy is basically saying that, um, uh, you know that you know we're now observing excesses and imbalances in the markets. I uh, explain that he is very attentive to that, to that, and that's why I do think at the earliest opportunity, I think uh, will be appropriate for us to start talking about adjusting those purchases. Uh, that we've got real excesses in the housing market, which is why he had not changed his view that rates should start to rise in 2022. Uh, so basically, it's kind of like the Fed is also, you know, as I've talked about before, Fed is also causing this housing market situation that we're in. And when you, so when you've got the Dallas Fed president saying, we've got excesses in the housing market, I mean, it's like, guys, I mean, it is what it is. I mean, so those who don't believe we have a bubble, don't believe, don't believe we're going to have problems, you know, when, when people like this are saying we got issues, I mean, you know, they're there. It's not like we're making this up. It's not because I'm a housing bubble dude that wants this to happen. Um, it's just because the numbers, the market, everything is pointing the direction that there has to be something. Something has to change in the near future to, to throw some correction, some, some, some price declines in the near future to balance this market out. Simple as that. So people that are much, much smarter than a lot of us out there are saying that there's ex excesses. 
and it has to happen. I found this interesting as well too. So mortgage complaints hit a three-year high, the CFPB say, says. The CFPB is the Consumer Consumer uh, Finance Protection Board. The whole idea is that you know it oversees a lot of the finances, mortgage lending, the whole bit, other things across the board here to ensure that the homeowners aren't being taken advantage of. Uh, this was created uh, due to what happened during the last housing crisis with the subprime mortgage meltdown. So this is why this CFPB was put in place as a watchdog to make sure things are happening. So the interesting note that I want to say here is, is that, um, so according to a report in March, uh, basically consumers submitted more mortgage complaints to the CFPB than any month since April 2018. And this is really kind of interesting because, um, you know, that, that that's a huge, you know, complaints mentioned forbearance and related items reached their highest monthly average uh, since March and April of 2020. The number of borrowers who reported struggling to make payments also rose. So this is kind of the, the situation where who do you believe, who do you trust, where is the information coming from? My sort of perspective has always been that we get contradicting information all the time. Thus, we've got different narratives running here, and it really boils down to who do you want to believe? To me, that's been the whole essence of what's going on in the media, regardless of, of what topic, industry, situation, politics you're looking at for the past year, of course. So the bad news for servicers who have already been warned by the CFPB because they did come out a few weeks ago to say servicing companies, banks and lenders better get your act together because expectations that, you know, when the forbearances actually stop, when they're over, um, when they've expired, we're going to see a lot of people who need help and be prepared, I guess, from an administration administration logistics solution point of view. Um, so, you know, they reiterated the warning again. The CFBP will continue to seek and actively respond to developments in the market, do everything in our power to help families stay in their homes. As we warned mortgage servicers last month, unprepared is unacceptable. Servicers may be the ones in the crosshairs right now, but everyone involved in the mortgage process should be paying attention. So what this basically boils down to is that you know consumers are saying they're getting conflicting information uh, about what options are available to them uh, regarding loan modification, things like that. Um, more borrowers are behind on their mortgage than at any time since the height of the Great Recession, said the CFPB acting director, uh, and you know, there's more that goes along with this. So that's why when you take a look at um, you know, all this great information about, oh, people are leaving their forbearances, they're paying off their loans, they're going back into making monthly mortgage payments. I, I just don't buy it, guys. I just don't. Like, I mean, you know, it's kind of like, look over here, look over here, don't worry about it. But yet, you know, you've got groups going, no, 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 no. That's not like, you know, the, the Dallas Fed guy says, we got some problems, all right? Even our NAR guy, the NAR economist earlier this year said, we've got problems in the future. And now we're, you know, so the, the you know, direct information is contradictory to each other. So if we're listening to Black Knight Mortgage News saying, hey, guess what? You know, people are dropping off forbearance. Uh, everything is great. Let's rejoice. You know, the housing market's coming due. Uh, people getting stimulus checks and unemployment checks and they're getting their jobs back. Well, okay, that's interesting. So, but, but as I said before, you know, just because you drop out of a forbearance plan doesn't mean that your loan problems have been solved. You've dropped out of a plan because the plan has expired. You still may need support, help to reinitialize your plan, do a loan mod, fall into foreclosure process. Who knows? So just because a pay count statistic has dropped off and the numbers show a big decline doesn't mean that problems have gone away. And I guess that's the point here. And then when you listen to CFPB, who's the watchdog for the consumers out there, the retail people, you guys, us out there, they're saying, well, we're seeing an uptick in complaints. We're seeing an uptick in questions. We're seeing an uptick in people who are saying they don't have solutions or are going to need solutions. That means that all these problems aren't solved. They're just not going to go away overnight. So please, that's the whole point I'm trying to make here is that once again, conflicted information. Who do you believe? Um, I always think it's best to err on the side of, you know, just being more conservative here, um, not doom and gloom, but being prepared for what's going to happen in the future. And again, if you talk to the people that I talk to, um, and which I'll share more information on the Facebook Live thing I'm talking about for next week, um, we know what's happening behind the scenes. We know what lenders are already doing, which you know, is a direct result of we're going to see problems in the near future. They're preparing for that. So we'll, I'll talk more about that on that presentation on May 11th here. So what's the next opportunity? Well, I guess what I'm saying now to people is it's time. 
All right. You know, we've been we've been putting this off. People are talking about you know, you know the government's kicking the can down the road. Well, that can is kind of run out of road now. And as you can see, just a matter of time when people are going, we're tired. We don't want to deal with this anymore. We need solutions. You know, I can't lose my home, or I, I have to ha like like things are changing. So ultimately, we've spent you know over a year now under a forbearance, pandemic, COVID things, whatever lock, whatever you want to say or call it, whatever it's been, all the little intricacies and pieces. Now, the housing industry is at this what I really call the that inflection point where it's going to start to change, and we'll start seeing some some we'll start seeing stuff manifest itself over the next couple of months now. As I mentioned, for example, Florida, we, you know, the Florida, basically the the information from the Supreme Court said, hey, at the end of May, we're now doing things to pick up the pace um, on foreclosure cases. So people down here who think they've got three or four years of, of doing nothing sitting in their home, they're going to be rudely awakened and surprised when that's not the case here. So it's time. So things are changing. Owners will need to sell. Um, the longer they wait, the more it's going to dip into their equity. Investors are going to have to liquidate. We will see uptick in foreclosure auctions as things open up again. For example, in the state of Florida where I'm at, we'll start to see more fines uh, will happen, which uh, ultimately should lead to some more short sales being listed. Eventually, foreclosure sales will pick up and hopefully some REOs. More will be available than predict, predicted down the road. I keep saying this because of the numbers that we look at differently than, than what's talked about in the media. We're not seeing the true numbers now. The, the, the market is being controlled. Uh, it's, being, it's really, as I say, suspended animation, on pause, whatever, you know, it really is manipulated. Whatever you want to call it, doesn't matter the word. The fact of the matter is it's being choked off. Uh, and, you know, we're at that peak right now. To me, it's almost like that last slap in the face going, you know what? Look at the timing of this, right? We were we were entering the spring summer selling season. Uh, people will be placing contracts on properties. You see the reports, you know, these pictures that circle around the internet about people, you know, 400 people lined up for an open house that came on the market in Texas or whatever. I don't know if that's a true photo. I think I've seen it for the past, you know, few months. But the, the point is that, you know, it's like we're at the ultimate peak, the ultimate breaking point. Let's get this jammed in right now because we know once this is over, once, you know, sort of, you know, July, August hits, people are going back to school, the, the typical frenzy of buying dies down, and then all these moratoriums are, you know, maybe over, can't be extended, then stuff's going to happen. All right. So that's where things are going to play out. Uh, mark my words. Uh, we'll see what happens in the very near future. So having said that, all right. Um, Guess what? What should you do? Well, you should start to take a look at distressed properties, right? Because that's where it's at. So, for example, um, I like to do short sales in my marketplace. So, look at the look at uh, the Tampa MSA here. Median sales price for single family home was two point. Uh, sorry. $295,000 February. Uh, median sales price of a foreclosure REO bought in the MLS was $278. A short sale was $217. So you got good equity there, good discount. And this is not even trying to get hard, big time discounts on there. We know we can get better in this. 77 k difference in equity. That's pretty good. Short sales make up nothing in the marketplace. No one's doing them for various reasons. So, hey, what are people, you know, you go after people who are facing foreclosure. You know what? Go to gethousingdata.com. I've partnered with foreclosure.com here. And for a small monthly fee, even a seven-day free trial, you can check out the distressed properties that are going on in your neck of the woods. We're talking, you know, foreclosures, foreclosure auctions, tax deed auctions, uh, other distressed property situations. So guess what? You can find out what's going on in your location to see what's happening to get yourself prepared for the future where you can buy a much cheaper property. So get, go to gethousingdata.com, check it out, subscribe, and you'll be happy you did. If you want more information on the training courses I have, partnering with me, working with me, etc., I'll tell you about it. Just connect with me at randy at luxurysharesales.com. So anyway, that's it for today, guys. So I just want to, that's, you know, important information, uh, you know, is out. The CDC is, is um, the, the eviction mor moratorium has been overturned by a federal judge. Doesn't stop, I think, local judges from interpreting the law locally and still helping out uh, individual tenants. But at least now we've got some precedent saying, hey, you know, this is being overturned here. This will support some of the other states and locations that are already doing this. Uh, things are changing in the real estate industry. Uh, tenants aren't going to have the protection they had before. Uh, please understand that I'm not, you know, it's a bad situation all in. I'm looking for a happy medium where, you know, if, if money was flowing to the landlords, things like this wouldn't have to happen. That's the way it goes, guys. So anyway, uh, look forward to speaking with you in a couple days. And remember, May 11th, I'm going to have that State of the Nation presentation. Make sure you're ready for that. All right. Take care, guys.